The 1999 movie Komodo is not exactly a classic of American cinema, and I don't recommend that you watch it. But there are some clips of the movie that are worth watching, like this one. Jimmy, what are you doing? That's a big lizard. I love Komodo dragons, but I also love these guys. This is a chameleon in the genus Perchisia. These are found in the leaf litter of Madagascar and are tiny. Perchisia and Komodo dragons are both squamates, the group that includes snakes and lizards. They diverged from a common ancestor about 160 million years ago. The smallest species of Perchisia is about three centimeters long. By contrast, Komodo dragons can be up to three meters long. If we represent the sizes of these two species by lines and compare them, we can see that we have a difference of about a factor of a hundred that's arisen since these two species descended from a common ancestor about 160 million years ago. Although that might seem like a lot of change, it's also a very long time. In order to decide whether this is really an exceptional amount of evolution or not, we need to compare this amount of evolution to what we might expect under some model. The model that we'll focus on today is Brownian motion. We can illustrate Brownian motion in a really simple way using a tortoise. Imagine that we put a tortoise in the middle of a room and allowed that tortoise to move around. But we're going to use this tortoise as our model for Brownian motion. So the tortoise is going to move under a Brownian motion model. If we allowed the tortoise to move freely around the room, it would follow a two-dimensional Brownian motion model. But that's overly complicated for what we want to talk about now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to restrict the movement of the tortoise by putting up two walls. Now, the tortoise can only move to the left or to the right, but not up and down. We mark the starting point of the tortoise with a red bar. This will become important later when we try to understand the properties of Brownian motion. Under our Brownian motion model, over every given period of time, the tortoise will move a little bit, either to the right or to the left. We can see that the tortoise is following a randomly wandering pattern. Now let's do a little thought exercise. Imagine that I put the tortoise in this situation, and then I left the room and came back in an hour. And I want to know where am I going to find that tortoise? Well, you don't know because this is a Brownian motion model. It's a random walk model. The way that the tortoise is going to move is going to be random and different from one time to the next. But what do you think is the best first place to look for our tortoise? Well, it turns out that the best place to look for the tortoise is exactly where you last saw it, right there at the red mark. It could be that the tortoise moved a little bit to the right of that starting position or to the left of that starting position. In fact, each of those options is equally likely. On average, the tortoise should be about in the same place that it started. There's also some smaller probability that the tortoise moved very far to the right or very far to the left. And we'll talk more about that full distribution later. Okay, next thought exercise. I come back in an hour and I find the tortoise here, off to the right a little bit from its starting position. Now I leave again for another hour and I come back to look for the tortoise. What is the best place to look for the tortoise now? Well, one option might be to look at where the red bar is. That's where our initial position for the tortoise was. However, that's not the most likely place to find the tortoise, given that we just saw it off to the right. In fact, now the most likely place to look for our tortoise is right there at that black bar. That's where we last saw it. This illustrates an important property of Brownian motion. Even though the tortoise has just moved a little bit to the right, the probability of moving again to the right or back to the left is still equal. The best way to express this is to say that the Brownian motion process is memoryless. What's come before will have no effect on what's coming next, and even though we've just moved to the right, we're equally likely to go more to the right or back to the left. Let's try to translate these principles into mathematical formulations. I'm going to note the position of the tortoise in this plot as z bar t. Z is going to stand later for phenotype of an organism, and bar is for the mean. So this will later represent the mean phenotype of a population. That's why I'm using this notation now. So the position of our tortoise is just z bar t, where t is time. The first property of Brownian motion that we already saw in the example of our tortoise, and we can illustrate with an equation, is illustrated here. 
And the way to read this equation is that the expected value of z bar t, that is, the expected position of our tortoise at time t, is equal to z bar 0, that is, the position of our tortoise at time 0 when we started. This is just a mathematical way of saying the same thing that we said before. If we start out with the tortoise at the red bar, go away for an hour and come back, we should look at the red bar. That's our most likely place to find our tortoise. The second important principle is that each successive interval of the walk is independent. That is, if we look at a time interval from 0 to 1 hour, and then from 1 to 2 hours, and then from 2 to 3 hours, what happens in each of those 1 hour time intervals is completely independent of what happens in all the other intervals. Even if the tortoise goes on a great jaunt in the first hour and moves way off to the right, the second hour the tortoise is equally likely to move to the left and to the right. There's no tendency to counteract anything that happened before in our random walk. I want to talk for a minute about the circumstances under which we might expect movement under Brownian motion. And we'll keep with our analogy of the turtle. Now, turtles probably don't follow a Brownian motion pattern when they walk. And one reason for this is because they have a head and a tail. So they're facing in a certain direction. If they've been going to the left, they probably will keep going to the left. A particle under Brownian motion uh, won't act in that way. Even though it's headed to the left, it's very likely to go to the right over the next time interval. The way that we get Brownian motion is we imagine that forces are acting on our object. So maybe we have an arrow that's pushing our tortoise to the right. It's better to draw it as a small arrow because what we're going to see is that Brownian motion is really the sum of a lot of really tiny forces acting over very small periods of time. So we have a little force acting to the right, and then another bigger one to the right, force acting to the left, another force acting to the right, and so on. And the sum of all of these forces determines the movement of our tortoise. If you imagine these forces getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the time interval that we're considering getting smaller and smaller and smaller and shrinking down, uh, but we're still talking about movement being the sum of all these small forces, then in the limit, as our time interval goes to zero, then we get a Brownian motion random walk. And this expression really captures the main statistical properties of Brownian motion that we're going to use for all of our analyses in the comparative methods course. So here we have an equation z bar of t, that little tilde, means is distributed as the capital N stands for a normal distribution. A normal distribution has two parameters, a mean and a variance. And this expression says that the distribution of our trade at time t follows a normal distribution with a mean of z bar 0 and a variance of sigma squared times t. The mean part of this expression we already know about. What we're imagining here is we start at z bar 0 and after some time interval, the expected distribution of places where we find our tortoise follows a normal curve with a mean that's equal to our starting position. It's just restating this fact that we go back to the red bar where we last saw the tortoise and look there first. And then the variance of that normal distribution depends on two things. T, time, so the longer of the time we wait, the wider our distribution gets, if that makes sense, and sigma squared. And sigma squared is the parameter that controls what people usually refer to as the rate of our random walk, the rate of Brownian motion. To understand that better, we can take our line where we've been plotting our tortoise position and make that the y-axis of a plot, that'll be position, and make the x-axis time. And then we can make a plot that actually tracks the position of our tortoise through time. So this is what our random walk looks like along the y-axis over some time interval. Now, if we superimpose a whole bunch of those random walks right here, here's 100, you can see that, on average, the ending position is the same as the beginning position, but there's a lot of spread. If we then look at that slice, that red line through the end, and plot the distribution of our points, we see this distribution here. It might not look that normal. That's because we have a pretty small sample size, but trust me, this does follow a normal distribution with a mean of 0. Here, my starting point is 0, so my mean is 0 and then a variance, and we can express that variance using our equation sigma squared times t. You can see the effect of time just by imagining taking slices through our random walk at different time intervals, and you can see that the variance of those positions that we see after different time intervals increase with time. And in fact, it increases linearly with time. This linear relationship between time and variance is one of the key statistical properties that makes Brownian motion especially easy mathematically to deal with in comparative analyses. Here's a set of plots showing the effect of our other parameter, sigma squared. So sigma squared 1 on top with row A, we can see a little bit of spread of points. Sigma squared of 10 and sigma squared of 25 
as that sigma squared parameter increases, we get more and more spread. That random walk spreads out more. We still have the same mean, which is equal to our starting point, but we have a wider spread of outcomes, even over the same time interval, because our sigma squared parameter is changing. Okay, so let's connect this back to evolutionary biology. And instead of a moving tortoise, now I want you to imagine an evolving tortoise. And I want you to imagine what's evolving is the size of that tortoise. So think about going to measure populations of tortoises through time, and when we measure those tortoises, we see that they've gotten bigger or smaller. That's going to be our axis of change. It's really common for people to use Brownian motion as a model for how traits change through time. It's also really common for people to interpret the meaning of that Brownian motion model in ways that I think are strange and incorrect. The first mistake that people make is equating Brownian motion with genetic drift. As you can see, if you look at that chapter in my book, we do expect to see traits evolving under a Brownian motion model when they're being affected by genetic drift, but there's also other ways to get Brownian motion trait evolution, even when there's strong selection. There's just a ton of ways that you can get Brownian motion under neutral models with no selection, under different kinds of models with selection, where selection is random through time, or the adaptive landscape is moving following Brownian motion. There's all sorts of ways that your data might look like this, and the fact that your data looks like Brownian motion tells you really nothing about the relative importance of selection and drift. The key point here is that Brownian motion results when we have lots of small and random forces acting on our trait through time. Those small random forces could be drift, but they could also be selection. The other thing that people do that I think is crazy is equating Brownian motion with some sort of phylogenetic constraint. That is, they fit their data to a Brownian motion model on a tree, and the better the fit to that Brownian motion model, the more that their trait is supposedly constrained by phylogeny. As you might notice from the equations, though, one of the key properties of Brownian motion is that it's completely unconstrained. The variance of our normal distribution increases with time, and that increase happens without any limit. In other words, the longer we wait, the more variance that we see. This means that Brownian motion is a completely unconstrained model. You might also think that this is not a very realistic model for trait evolution. If we think about our tortoises, if we waited long enough, there's some probability that we should see a tortoise smaller than an atom or larger than a blimp. But we don't see this on Earth because real evolution is actually constrained and occurs within some hard limits of survival for organisms. The last thing I want to rant about is trends. You can see that one of the key properties of Brownian motion is that we expect the trait to be the same value after any amount of time. That is, the mean of our normal distribution doesn't change under Brownian motion. That means that Brownian motion can't be used to model trends, and trends of trait evolution are actually common in the fossil record. The other strange thing about Brownian motion, though, is that if there is a trend present and we just sample species from one time period, we won't actually see that trend. The trend becomes invisible. So not only does Brownian motion not have a trend, but it doesn't even allow you to look for trends in your data. And that's something to be aware of, whether we're fitting a Brownian motion model to our data to estimate parameters or trying to estimate ancestral states. Even given all these limitations of Brownian motion, it's by far the most common model that we see in comparative biology for continuous traits. Next up, we'll see how to fit Brownian motion models to a phylogenetic tree.